You're listening to the Multifamily Innovation Show with Patrick Antrim, your source for innovative strategies for multifamily professionals, CEOs, executive leaders, and aspiring leaders that want to drive high-performance results for their property or portfolio. Uh, excited about what's ahead. Um, we've hit our 35th year uh, in 2021, and uh, I was asked in 2016 to take on the responsibility of moving the company from first generation leadership to second generation. So Ooh. the Mark Taylor brands near and dear to Jeff and Scott, and they want to ensure that it continues forward. And my sole mission is to ensure that Mark Taylor is better when I leave the organization for the third generation, mm. uh, hopefully in many years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's a hard shift to make, I would imagine. Um, and I know with the state that we're in now, technology and all the focus around the shifts that we had to make, but people and culture still matter. Uh, it's incredibly important, right? So uh, people is our key core strategic initiative. We have three, uh, but people is really what Mark Taylor has always been mm-hmm. and will be about. Uh, they yeah. really are the foundation of the organization. And as Dustin alluded to yesterday, yeah. uh, and I, what I like to say is the, the EX, the, the employee experience mm. matters to me. Um, so we've, we've doubled down on that over the last uh, six months and we'll continue to do so. And I want to make sure that our employees have, have a home. We like to refer to home as vision and mission. It's part of our statements mm. and it's important that they have a career and a, a place to call home. So we're going to continue to focus on, on that culture piece long-term. Yeah. And, and 20 years at the company, that's, that's not heard of. Uh, well, it's not, I mean, there, obviously there are a lot of people that have done that, but it's very rare now. Absolutely. Um, what, what made that special for you to stay on? I mean, that was a, probably a journey of different r- market cycles, uh, challenges. Uh, yeah, I mean, a lot, of, uh, a lot of folks I work with today have never seen a downturn, which is really interesting, including mm-hmm. my employees. Uh, so, you know, I still have writings and journal entries and, and notes from 2008, 2009, and 10, and it's been a tremendous ride. So, um, you know, it doesn't always go up, uh, and it's important that everyone knows that. And for me, my journey... Uh, personally, I mean, Mark Taylor became my home, uh, it really in 2002, uh, I was a trailblazer, uh, personally sure. moving from Minnesota, Midwest to okay. Phoenix, Arizona. So I trailblazed first one here, didn't know anyone, uh, and just fell in love with, with the environment, the city, uh, and really the people at Mark Taylor. Yeah, that's interesting. And, um, I got to just imagine that, um, part of that, I mean, you're leading the company now, so that. That passion, that's important at the top. I mean, it's one Mm -hmm. thing to be, we talked a little bit about, you know, building and developing for the return, get in, get out, and and, and sort of that transactional focus. Mm -hmm. Um, When you're working uh, and building for somebody that truly at leadership starts at the top. That's right. uh, At the ownership top, but also in your level where um, that has to trickle down. Um, what, What gets you excited in terms of, where, where do you go, I guess, for that, to keep that edge at the highest peak? Because, um, you know, it's you, you got to stay in, uh, inspired yourself, too. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, let's just talk about market cycles. So I think about, uh, you know, working through the recession of 2008, uh, moving back into a really long-term bull cycle. So 2011 through 2020. And I think as an organization, you have to constantly adapt. And one of our, one of our founding principles be better than yesterday. Mm. Uh, and that's been one of my mantras for a long time. So I'm certainly better than I was last week, last month, last year. Uh, I'm still proud of where I am today, but I know I'm going to be better tomorrow and next week and next right. month. Um, so with that being said, uh, I think having a, a bull run of such nine years of really tremendous apartment fundamentals. So you think about rents going up five, six, seven percent per year, uh, NOI moving up, uh, Dustin alluded, alluded to that yesterday, having 71% of our clients reaching their highest NOI, um, you know, factoring the leads, the volume, the demand, all of those things. I think as an industry, uh, we, we became a bit complacent. So if you think about what we've always done, mm-hmm. uh, there was a lot of that from 2011 through 2020. Right. So I think the the shot in the arm, the the earthquake of the pandemic was, you know, a lot of negativity around the pandemic, but it was really a crisis that we had to take an opportunity of. And and, and the reality was, um, in March, you know, we didn't know what was going to happen. March of 2020, mm-hmm. we said, okay, here's the pandemic. Uh, we hedged against the the risk of the unknown, uh, and certainly when we we look back, and I'll go back to May of last year, so just 60 yeah. days post. 
uh, and we looked at our data from April. We're very data centric. And in April, we rented twice as many, twice as many apartments per unit than we normally would with our doors locked during a pandemic. Hmm. And it was Who an epiphany thought? moment for us, right? right? We said, what the hell went on? What are we going to do? Yeah. What's, what's happening? And, uh, you know, it really gave us an opportunity really to look at our business and say, okay, what can we do to modify and change, right? So it's the old saying, learners inherit the earth and the learned are beautifully equipped to handle the world of, of yesteryear, right? Sure. So, so we were focused on what's going to happen tomorrow. So we really, we, we focused for months on breaking down our business. You know, what's, mm. what's a, an assistant manager doing? Should they do this? Should they not do this? What's a technician doing? And really understanding the things that really matter at the site level uh, and trying to understand our business all over again. I right. mean, it was really a, uh, a full autopsy of, of what we do at Mark Taylor. And, and I think other groups, I mean, I'm not the only one, are looking at how do we modify our behaviors, our culture, uh, and adapt and, and utilize technology. We're in a technology revolution. So if you think back, you know, you know timeline, industrial revolution, technology revolution, uh, I think if you compare it, industrial revolution was, was moving at a snail pace. I mean, technology revolution is light speed. Right. Uh, there's a lot of noise. So you have to distill it down and say, okay, what really matters? Identify the technology that really works, that matters to your residents, matters to your employees. It's efficient. It's easy to use. Uh, and understand how you can put that into your business to propel it. And I think that's the challenge for, for many of us as we, as we look forward. And anyone listening knows that that's the case. Yeah. And I love that because oftentimes we think this thing outside, this new hire, this new whatever it is outside is the focus like uh, i need another deal or or i'm going to i'm going to pursue something outside mm -hmm. the organization to fix the sure. growth or the, sure. the the expenses or or whatever it may be and uh, i like how the inward focus is you know look what are we doing maximize those things and and start with the assessment of it mm -hmm. and then um you know because some of those assumptions we didn't have before about like what you're talking about leasing in, in april versus you know those periods it's completely different it's, that's right. Completely different. Um, so with all that change and at the speed of that change and the fact that you guys care so much about the personal experience, the culture, all that stuff, even for employees, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. um, when, when you have people renting apartments, they're not even making it <clears throat> to the apartment. How do you control all those stories, all that conversations to where it is about you know, a personal experience when they're using this technology, I guess. Sure. I think uh, when you look at um, kind of how our, our leasing process transformed for most folks, right? We went to uh, virtual tours, uh, you know, guiding folks through phone and or video, sure. uh, helping them understand what, what the, the communities are all about, uh, moving to self-guided tours. Uh, we saw that spike in May and June, up to 75% of our activity was virtual and or self-guided. Mm. Um, so the reality of it was there was no real personal connection. So the question we wanted to solve for, and this is part of assessing our business and looking forward with our strategy, how do we create a white glove experience? Dustin alluded to this yesterday, mm. a white glove experience for that resident from the first time they search through the leasing process, through the move in, their living experience and the move out, right? Because we know f we get dinged on the move out. They could have a phenomenal experience the entire time, be a resident for five years and the move out process is, is negative and you get a one star review. Mm -hmm. So how do you have that white glove approach from start to finish? And I think it's, it's really identifying how you mirror technology and the personal, the personal focus with your employees and staff and really understanding the, the hot points. So I'll give you some examples. So from, from the first lead touch, Dustin mentioned we built our CM platform. Mm -hmm. The CRM is very instrumental in how we've identified lead volume, who's searching, who's looking, who's calling all of those things so we can identify who our consumer is. I think that's a big piece of it. I mean, we have a very small bucket. We're class A only asset management in Phoenix and Las Vegas. So the reality is there's only so many folks looking at Mark Taylor. Now, some of that has shifted because of the pandemic. If you look at our Google analytics, our fifth most searched city is LA County or part of LA County. Um, so people are looking to Phoenix, as we know, you look at in migration, 120,000 people in 2020. The reality is we have to understand what the consumer wants. So the old model of, okay, we're going to open our leasing office from nine to six. That's where we're going to answer phones. And that's where we're going to handle traffic or people that want to live here is a bit broken. I mean, we have to think about, uh, the greatest really technology companies of our time. Think of Amazon as an example, mm -hmm. they're open 24 seven. If you want to buy those beautiful shoes, you can buy them at 11 o'clock at night right. from your couch on your iPad. 
So if someone wants to come to Mark Taylor at 11 o'clock and, and look at us through a search, they want to identify a unit, they want a lease, we have to make that happen. We have to be available to the consumer. And they have so many available channels to, to find us. Sure. Uh, we have to make sure that we're hitting them when they want to hit us, right? So when I say hit, meaning connect. We have to connect with them. So it can't just be technology. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Dustin alluded to our AI chat um, hubs, right? Mm-hmm. I haven't met the guy, but he sounds awesome. Yeah. Uh, and he's converting 40% of our leads to actual appointments. So, you know, is that, uh, is that all within that nine to six range? Of course not. Uh, because people are busy and they want things now. They're on their phone. Sure. And if you're, if you're an Apple user and you're on your phone, that's a pretty beautiful technology user experience, right? So we have to match the, the UI UX of what everyone else is producing uh, along with our EX, our employee experience. So it all mirrors together and meshes well. So we're looking for those constant hotspots to ensure that we're eliminating the intent to rent, right? Meaning we, we don't want to block them or filter them at certain points of the process so that they go somewhere else. Make it as easy as possible, simple, easy, fast. Allow them to move to Mark Taylor and take care of them at that five, five-star experience. Yeah, you know, you, you hear, um, you mentioned like Amazon and these, these types of brands. You start hearing uh, early stages of Amazon when they were um, not even profitable. They were just taking any dollars and it was just continually reinvestment and they obviously won that e-commerce game. Sure. Um, and there was probably a lot of people that uh, were running the old way along the way, you know, still doing that. But you hear the voice of these sort of innovators. They're always focused on the customer. I mean, you look at mm-hmm. the Zappos conversation, sure. even early days of that. And they're really looking at that customer. The CEO historically in multifamily has been, you know, they've, they've been successful and, and they've, uh, you know, th- their, their companies have been profitable and there hasn't been a lot of need to maybe say, oh, we have to change because <laughs> We have to figure out a cash flow. I mean, sure. they are cash flowing; they're doing well, and so it's hard to. How do you not disrupt that? But mm-hmm. I'm starting. It's refreshing to hear your remarks because you sound like um, you know you're leading a, a real estate operation, mm. but you're talking in terms of technology, the customer, leaders, all these these elements. Are you seeing a, a massive shift in the way executives and multifamily need to think about the business in that? Um, you know, it's, it's goes beyond just what's the cash flow, what's the, the cap rates, what's mm-hmm. the de- market, dem- like the transactional elements. Sure. You just can't win on that anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think um, our industry has been a bit antiquated over the years. We've been re- referred to that, uh, right? Uh, so I think the, the pandemic has, has shifted the mindset for many. Uh, we, we talk about growth mindset within our executive mm-hmm. team a lot. Um, so the question is from... A leadership perspective how do you adapt and grow your business to take advantage of the technology uh, while maintaining the personal edge uh, and for us it's about you know starting as I said with our employees ensuring that they have the right experience and I think you know we, we had this conversation at, at a dinner last night um, you have to get buy-in from your culture your employees your team uh, so they have to understand the why why are you doing this you know what's the purpose uh, you have to have a feedback loop. I think they alluded to the 360 earlier in, mm-hmm. in the last presentation. Uh, understanding the, the pain points at the site level, listening. Uh, that's a big piece of it for me. Identifying uh, with with my team, my 600 employees, here's what we have to do to be better. And if I'm not listening to them and I'm just saying, hey, go do this and there's no buy-in, sure. it's not going to work. Um, and especially in, in this environment where things happen so fast with technology. So understanding through the feedback loop, you know, what, what they need, what they desire, how we can fix things. Uh, I meet now, uh, started this in January. I, I do a clubhouse chat. Uh, we used to do videos and uh, written statements. Now I'm live, right? We have the technology again sure. to, to be live. So during a pandemic, I can connect with all of my employees and we have live chat so I can answer questions on the fly. Uh, one of our principles is be transparent, right? So it's right. got to go both ways. So if they ask me a tough question, I'm going to answer it. Right. Uh, and, and that's how it has to be. And, and that's how we'll evolve as an organization uh, as fast as possible. So being better, better than yesterday is part of evolution, right? It's, it's human nature. Yeah. If you want to get better, I mean, that's how we've all evolved. Uh, technology just goes like that. Right. Uh, but as an organization, uh, we have to take it a little slower, uh, mm-hmm. connect with everyone, ensure that we understand the why. And then propel forward and move ahead. And with buy-in, we'll we'll be successful. 
Mm. Speaking of technology and, and the buy-in, you guys do a lot of due diligence. It seems like even building some of your own uh, internal uh, um, technologies. Right. Uh, let's go into the, the touring aspect. You mentioned accelerated tours. You talked about the bot converting 40% of the leases. Mm -hmm. Uh, once they land, you guys are doing self-guided tours now. Tell me about how you thought about that partnership. Uh, I believe you're with Smart Rent. You Correct. brought on. Correct. How did that? How did you think about that? Why did you go down that road? And and uh, you know how is it helping you? I guess. Yeah, I mean the, the first step was identifying the right partner, Lucas and team, and, and making sure that uh, their value system, their growth mindset, what they're trying to accomplish fits with ours. So aligning the partnership first, and then looking at the technology to ensure that. They're also flexible because we're very unique and, and we want to make mm -hmm. sure that the, the process, the white glove process for our residents uh, fits. Uh, you know, it, it can't be clunky. Sure. Um, so, if, you know, if you can't get your picture to upload from your driver's license or um, your code doesn't work at the door, uh, those things can't happen, right? So really taking time to vet that process, working with them in a collaboration effort to ensure that we're rolling out the right process so that our, our prospects have a good experience. So again, if you have great people on staff and you're touring them, it's it's easy to counter if something is wrong. And there's, you know, we're not perfect, things happen. But on a self-guided tour, it's almost all technology. So ensuring that it works, it's functional, it's easy to use, that the resident can can with intent get through that process quickly and identify us as a, as a place they want to call home. Yeah. Are, and you're doing these tours now? We are. We are. And were, were there... Um, things that assumptions that you may have tested that otherwise you're like wow I, I learned this went a lot smoother than expected or what, yeah I mean what we were, the we were you know like? we've always been a uh, boutique personal touch organization and we, we pride ourselves on that connectivity ensuring that you have that that concierge concierge level high touch approach uh, so it was odd to see a prospect uh, come through our, our our one of our sites and not talk to us uh, yeah, they're just looking at our beautiful community and you know walking through the lush landscape and going in the unit checking it out and then leaving <laughs> yeah. so it's just like okay is this going to work so a lot of uh, breath holding during those processes yeah. but uh the reality is people get it you know you go to cvs you can check out yourself you go to right. home depot same thing so it's about adapting um so how do we, we continue to have that boutique personal touch feel that's what we're focused on so yeah. that's that's phase two of what we talked yeah. about and if we'll May. do the cvs stuff that's like Harder work, you know. <laughs> right, right. Uh, at least, at least you, they, you know. Sometimes other markets um, train the customer in a way that allows the timing of these, you know, four years ago, ten years ago, self-guided tours maybe would be the wrong time, right? Sure. Um, so timing, and I'm assuming coming off of the the COVID, it was a great story to accelerate a full adoption. Absolutely. Um, what, do you think it would have been any different if we didn't have COVID? If it was just like, hey, we're doing this, and then some residents would just go to the leasing office and, and not have uh, the lane? Or yes and no, I, th I think you'd have <laughs> uh, you know fewer people doing it, and it wouldn't be the norm, right? So it also forced the consumer to behave different. Yes. Uh, so I think it just accelerated it. It would have gotten here. It just maybe would have been Over 2024, time. not 2020. Yeah. Uh, so that's the difference, and I think uh, you know it, it, it's 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 here to stay. Yeah. Yeah. Any predictions when you think other? I mean, not everybody's doing this. Um, any any thoughts around the timing of that? Uh, how long that takes probably to get into full where it is a, a total? Because right now you're using it as a differentiator almost in some cases. Yeah. I mean, I think um, there's a lot of groups doing it. Uh, I think it'll be the norm at some point. It'll be 24/7. Uh, the question will be, you know. How does it adapt? What's next from that process? Um, can you move in that at that same? You know, can you tour a unit and then move in uh, mm -hmm. without the interaction? Um, that's a possibility. I mean, I think there's so many things that are available now from a technology standpoint. Yeah. Um, I mean, think back even five years ago, uh, we built San Travisi in South Scottsdale. We were the first GigaBlast community by Cox. Um, so really ensuring that our community was future proofed with with the horsepower of of, sure. of the pipe. Uh, to maximize on future development of iPhones and managed Wi-Fi and people streaming. And, you know, you have to think about those things. I think that's as important as ever. Um, without that technology, this one exists. So mm -hmm. it's important that, you know, we adapt and, and, and look forward. Yeah. What do you, what's the feedback you're getting from your residents, I guess, the, the ones that are using? Uh, I, I mean, I think, uh, you know, the ones that use the self-guided tour, typically are ones that uh, get, I mean, they get that process, they understand technology, they're comfortable with it. Um, we're still there to do a personal tour if necessary, 
we don't want to eliminate that. Again, we want sure. to create as many possible channels for them, least path of least resistance to get them into our community and, and make it their home. So uh, I think all of those things will, will, will modify and adapt, but it's important to be good at be, be good or better at all of those things. Yeah, yeah. And, and we talked, we opened up with a little bit of culture. Um, uh, internally, how, how are you managing through the, the you mentioned about buy-in and how do, do you uh, get the same buy-in around new, uh, new things you try in the business in terms of technology or new approaches? Obviously, shift, shifting to taking every tour with the leasing professional versus, you know, maybe a technology uh, doing it. Uh, how do you, how do you go about, approach that communication, I guess, with the buy-in? I mean, you, you said it, it's communication. So in, ensuring that, that our folks understand why uh, I'll be working with them in, in March, end of March with our next clubhouse chat to ensure they understand our 24 month pipeline of decision making and, and, and execution of, of what we just talked about earlier. Um, so I want clarity, right? Transparency. Uh, that's first step. Uh, and then helping us, meaning leadership, and them identify better ways to be efficient at the site. Mm. I think that's a big thing uh, that most groups are focused on. I know we are. Um, so f- first step was analyzing, like I mentioned. I mean, understanding right. our, our business as it was and how we shift that. So mm-hmm. uh, as Dustin mentioned, we now have a scheduler which exists for our residents and the idea being let's be more efficient and, and allow our residents, our precious residents to have 30 minute blocks so they can have full ownership of manager's time, uh, 100% focus versus phones ringing, someone coming to tour uh, and really reshaping how we format our entire day 24 uh, seven. So that's just one thing that we're doing and many things to come, but that's, that's a piece, piece of controlling efficiency and, and taking better care of our residents and allowing our employees to focus on that. Yeah, and, and moving back to that tour, I might, I wanted to hit on this point, and we'll bring it in a smart run actually later to talk technical stuff on the how, but, um, you know, how did you think about that in terms of the risk, in terms of, um, you know, how you identify, the, is it by credit card, is it by identification, all the tools that come together with that? How did you think about that? Um, we went both ways, right? So in lots of spirited debate, should we ask for ID? credit card information, fill out a form, all of these things versus just let anyone in that has intent to rent. So, you know, we had to blend the best of both to, sure. to, to maintain safety protocols and ensure that we did it the best way. And I think making making it real functional and easy uh, so you can scan your ID and you can get in the unit. That's the, mm-hmm. that's the reality. Uh, I think most of, most of our consumers are, are, are good actors uh, and they play the right way. So, you know, you might have things happen that you don't want to have happen in your unit or at your community, but I think you gotta, you gotta toe the line of doing it in a way that makes it really easy for them uh, right. without getting it to a level that's too cumbersome or, or difficult. Right. right, and uh, sometimes we anticipate the risk being greater than it really truthfully is. Sure. <laughs> sometimes we have that's more information right. with that information anyway. Um, uh, were any surprising results, I guess, that you, you, you know, somebody that's maybe viewing and they haven't yet been down this path yet, Anything that uh, was surprising to you that you maybe didn't expect? Yeah, I mean, I think if you look at our, our, our data in 2020, so we did a full assessment from March 15th through okay. the end of the year in 2020 and did a year-over-year comparison for that same time frame. So we saw our web sessions increase 45%. We saw our lead conversions increase 26%, which was a bit surprising. So when you think about our old model, we said, okay, we have to have – uh, our stellar staff handling these phone calls and these tours to ensure that we close and, and convert these leads. Mm. Uh, the data said otherwise. Uh, let let the consumer be the consumer. Uh, if they want to handle the process from AI to to a virtual tour to leasing without contact, that's great. Let's allow them to do so. So I think the consumer spoke, uh, and I was surprised a bit by the data. Uh, secondly. I think our staff and, and how dynamic they are and how they were able to adapt quickly to that process was amazing. Uh, you know, in working during the, the pandemic, I'm so proud of our teams and what they've accomplished uh, and how they processed the, the, the quick change. You know, less than 30 days, we're doing self-guided tours. Uh, pretty impressive uh, with, with the results and, and how they handled the situation. Yeah, are you, what are you seeing from uh, the... Well, I guess the responses, uh, there's the conversation of the role. How do you re-envision roles within all of these changes in organizations? 
uh, you obviously are a group that thinks about what's next. Uh, what's possible, I guess, with um, the way that we utilize the teams on site? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you know, another principle. Too early is, to tell, it, maybe, but but I think yeah. So if we look at you know how we think about the business, uh, we ask uh, every employee to take extreme ownership. So mm -hmm. by that I mean, you know, they're looking at ways to be better themselves, but also better the business. So, you know, we're asking, we're getting feedback, we're, we're trying different things to ensure that uh, the the leasing consultant of tomorrow is focused on high impact items, mm -hmm. efficiency, doing things that really matter. Um, an assistant manager uh, in 2019 did bookkeeping, was a salesperson, was a resident counselor, uh, was a manager when the, when the manager was away, uh, might clean units if we're short staff. I mean, doing all of these things uh, without a lot of efficiency. So how do we carve that up and make sure that if someone wants to be a bookkeeper, we take advantage of their skill set and, and mm. that's where they want to be and allowing them to have a cool awesome career path, right? Something that they really want to do and enjoy. Yeah. So if you want to be in sales and you want to focus on sales, let's find a way to do that. If it's customer service and in the back end, you want to grow those relationships with residents, more of a, you know, concierge resident relation, uh, relation period, do that. And I think, you know, we have to identify ways to allow that to happen. So being more flexible with roles, I think fast forward five years, you won't just have a leasing consultant. You won't just have a, an assistant manager or manager. I think there's going to be a tremendous amount of ad adaptation uh, with sure. regards to those roles and the, the things that they actually want to do and, and focus on, and it'll help our business. Right, the right people doing the right things, and, and, and we're disrupting, like you mentioned, the roles of the job descriptions, I guess. Right. Uh, even in the journey you mentioned, um, you're on that journey. I mean, you, you came to a company and, and obviously have grown to tremendous success uh, to, to be in your position. Uh, what advice do you give to, to leaders today that are, um, you know, from regional managers, VP, wherever they are? What, what advice would you give uh, that seemed to work for you? Uh, a lot of things. Uh, I think for us, um, the shift in the last few years has been about understanding who we are, uh, the why behind, we, why, why do we do certain things, what are our mm -hmm. principles, what's our mission, what's our vision, and saying, okay, how do we align folks that want to be with Mark Taylor? Meaning if someone applies, do they fit our characteristics, our DNA? Do they fit with our principles? Do they want to be within an organization that truly has a career path uh, and they want to be here long term? Uh, it's not just a job for us. So mm -hmm. uh, we developed a talent acquisition platform. So we have a, a, a full team that focuses just on that. We want to ensure that we're bringing in highly capable, talented, educated individuals that want to be part of our culture. Uh, we want to protect it. Uh, so that's a, a big piece. Identify who you want to hire uh, and make sure they're, they're the, the type of people that fit your organization. I think that matters a lot and it's helped us be successful in areas. And it doesn't mean they have to be in the industry, right? Find yeah. different ways, different areas to, to focus on. Uh, you know, there's, there's, there's other folks that, that can find multifamily. I did. I was an out of work engineer. So, I mean, there's, there's, there's a great path once you receive yourself into Mark Taylor mm. and, and, and start your career path. And uh, it's a home for a reason. I want people to stay forever. Uh, if they leave, uh, I want them to say, I had a great experience at Mark Taylor. I was treated well. Uh, we did the right thing as an organization. I was trained. Uh, I'm better today as I leave Mark Taylor and I go do something else. Maybe they start their own company. Fantastic. Sure. I'll support them, but I want to be a positive piece of their journey. Interesting. It's very similar to what you were talking about, uh, you know, that last move out piece affecting yeah. the, the review on Yelp and, and wherever else. Um, you have that same approach on the employee experience, uh, even beyond. You just mentioned starting your own company and, you know, maybe that doesn't happen that often. But having that mindset of uh, you're here because, A, you're adding value to the team, but also you want to, you choose to be here. I'd love to talk more about your talent. I mean, we're talking about leasing. We're talking about how everything has changed. It. Are you approaching things differently in the way that you find and discover talent? Because you mentioned you built your own uh, team or mm -hmm. software, or whatever that may be. But uh, are you looking at it differently? Uh, no question. I mean, uh, you know, three years ago we'd say, okay, we have to have a leasing consultant that has leasing experience and and knows our industry, right? I'm just using one example. Today we say, okay, we have to find someone that's highly competent has the right attitude, right? fits our principles, uh, wants to be better, uh, and then align them with our training department. So meaning if they're gonna come into our organization fresh, they know nothing about multifamily, I'm okay with that. Uh, if they wanna learn, right? They wanna build their career and develop themselves, help the organization bring us value, 
uh, we'll find a way to train them and, and create a sure. career path. And it doesn't mean that you have to stay at least a leasing consultant. It doesn't mean that you have to be an MCO. I mean, there's a lot of different areas to grow. In. I mean, we've doubled our, our organization in the last five years. So we've created, I think, 21 new positions at the corporate office. Mm. I mean, there's a lot of opportunity within the, the, the Mark Taylor sphere. So, you know, yeah. I think identifying the right individuals uh, matters a lot. Yeah. Uh, so let, let's talk a little bit about the Phoenix market, if you will. Sure. I mean, you're here, you, you guys have the, the greatest history of uh, the legacy of, of a sure. brand. Um, what are you seeing? In ter- I mean, we mentioned LA, the biggest searches coming from different mm-hmm. areas. I mean, that, it seemed like Phoenix already had uh, a little bit of that natural migration anyway. Right. Um, but now, with obviously recent changes, are you seeing more uh, acceleration in that? And, and where are we with the development? Because I know matching all those elements up is, is problematic sometimes. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I like to say all arrows point to Phoenix. Uh, so go back to 2009, 2010. Uh, <laughs> no one wanted to be near Phoenix. Right, it was like the plague. But we were more of a real estate market then, and so you had like this up down. But now, uh, did they come back a little bit more diverse? Yeah, I think. I mean, we are. I like to use the term anti fragile at this point. Um, I think we really uh, learned from our our bad decisions uh, pre pre recession. Right, we were cons- construction heavy, single family home market. Um, so I think through great leadership at the state level, local level. Uh, Michael Crow with ASU, the investment in education, diversifying our workforce, ensuring that we have the right talent to to really, you know, focus in on on organizations and companies that want to move to Phoenix. Uh, you know, they're looking for for just that, uh, and we have that today. We've become more competitive in in the in the pro business space. Uh, you know, aligned with Texas, Utah, Florida. Uh, so you're seeing that inflow from California, and then you look at just the the capital market inflow right now we are the darling everyone wants to be here uh the sales volumes the 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 cap rate compression it's quite remarkable what's happening in phoenix so uh, my phone rings off the hook with guys saying hey i need to buy a deal in phoenix well sure everybody does um and then you factor in the demographic shift right so i mentioned california so in our top 25 google analytics search uh, queries in 2020 uh we had all in the top 25 la county Irvine, San Diego, New York, Chicago, Portland, Las Vegas, Dallas. So, you know, you think about the dynamic of, of, of what's happening in, in, in those cities and the issues that, that, that they're seeing. And, right. uh, hey, move to sunny Phoenix. Things are pretty good here. And I, I think that's why you've seen the shift. The question is, uh, we've always had a very specific uh, data set that said jobs equal apartment, apartment mm-hmm. growth, right? That's always been the case. Uh, not in 2020. So, for the first time ever, and we're, we're, we're keen and big on data, for the first time ever, that, that, that formula doesn't exist because you could have some from, someone from San Francisco uh, moving to Phoenix for six months or 12 months, but still working for a company in True. San Francisco. So where do, you, where do you ink that job? Is it here? Is it California? Right. So I think there's been a lot of that. The question will be, does, does that change uh, to the negative, right? So as we open post-pandemic, uh, are they getting called to go back to San Francisco? I need you in the office five days a week. Um, yeah. So we'll see how that fits. Uh, and we're in the midst of uh, 24 months of some of the most development we've ever seen uh, in comparison to 1986 and 85. So we'll see how the supply side pressure uh, yeah. affects uh, what we're seeing from the demand yeah, side. And as a leader, you've invested in technologies to do self-guided tours and all these things to operate more efficiently. And I assume companies, like you mentioned, if it's in San Francisco, they've made those investments to still serve customers remotely and maybe they're looking right. at that <laughs> that expense line going well you know you know that's that's what I'm hoping in a lot of ways but it'll change the way as you said people look at it's no longer like this circle around the <laughs> that's right the radius and that we, we look at um, what's your story to investors I guess uh, what 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 should they know and um, yeah I'll just start with that yeah I mean if, if you're looking at multifamily I think uh, the fundamentals still matter, right? So uh, buying deals that make sense, location matters, quality matters, uh, understanding the market. I feel like there's there's been a, a, such a uh, arrow pointing of, of sorts, meaning so many people are chasing Phoenix and like, I'll just buy that deal uh, and I'll pay whatever. Mm-hmm. Well, do you know the sub-market? Uh, do you know the, the municipality? Do you know the city council? Uh, do you know the job growth story? Right. Do you understand really, you know, every specific submarket? Because Phoenix is a vast city, uh, Phoenix Metro, 
And if you look at, you know, how we're developing in Goodyear down to Queen Creek and Casa Grande and the explosion uh, of the multifamily growth, uh, where do you want to be? So I think fundamentals matter. Uh, you know, there's a bit of frenzy FOMO effect that's happening. Mm -hmm. uh, and you see that in the single family space. I think it's one of the rare times where you have tremendous strength in the single family sales market along with multifamily. It's pretty rare, right? So you have 1.1 months of supply in, in the single family side. Uh, multiple offers above listing, uh, and it's translating into now, okay, well, the pandemic's subsiding a bit, so I don't necessarily need a house. Now it's shifting to the condo market. So you're seeing the condo market uh, increase in value in terms sure. of demand uh, and price uh, on top of a multifamily market that has tremendous operations right now. We've, mm. we've had one of the best quarters on record uh, during a pandemic in 2021. Right. Who would have known? <laughs> You know, exactly. I think we were all a little concerned going in, but uh, it's nice to know that we've, we, we do have the, the, the fundamental. That gives confidence and strength to, to sustain uh, new, new, new challenges, I guess. Sure. Um, you've done so much for not only your brand, but the industry. I know that you've served uh, AMA. You've done some work there. Yeah. Um, how has that experience been, and, and what, what do you tell others in terms of how to get involved in, in industry aspects? Yeah, I think it's so incredibly important to be involved in your associations, your local associations. So the Arizona Multi-Housing Association, I think they're in, we're in our 53rd or 54th year. Uh, I know they're, they're recognized on, on the national front as being one of the leaders uh, as, a, as an association. Uh, I think for me, a couple things. One, uh, getting to know other leaders within the industry. Uh, I think uh, the AMA does a nice job. We have a large board, 50 plus people, uh, but a, a nice job of just getting to know each other, being friendly, talking through issues, understanding other pain points with, with other groups, other companies, right. uh, and really coming together as one voice to ensure that you know, our, our, our industry is successful. Mm -hmm. And that matters to me. And if you think about the the shifting of the political sands, if you will. I mean, our industry is under attack nationally. Mm -hmm. True. Uh, so we have to protect ourselves. Uh, that's why in 2019, when I chaired the board, uh, we had a huge emphasis focus on BGF or Better Government Fund. Uh, we really had to raise raise awareness, raise funds to ensure that we had a war chest to defend ourselves. Uh, you know, through Doug Ducey's leadership uh, and, and controlling the Senate and House uh, in a favorable multifamily way, we've been able to kind of thwart the rent control conversations, mm -hmm. uh, but it's not going to stop. So right. uh, I think if there's anything that I tell anyone listening, make sure you get involved, make sure you understand those issues, uh, focus on the, the, the city council level, right? I mean, make sure that you're involved, that you're, you're reaching out to those members to ensure yep. that they understand that you know, we're not bad landlords. We're trying to create homes for people. Uh, and it matters, matters a lot if, 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 if we're compressed and we're, we're riddled with rent control and, and red tape. Uh, it's going to be an issue for everyone. Yeah. I, I don't make recommendations or predictions, uh, but I will talk to you just in reference points to like Elon Musk, you know, the, sure. the, uh, the story, you know, you, you, you have uh, the, well, the, the legacy story of like, Ford, the, you know, Henry Ford, right? At one point it was one individual with this vision and, and now you yeah. have an automaker. But as time has gone on, uh, you know, it, it hasn't been about Henry really as much. You know, now you have Tesla. It's like Elon sure. Musk and he's trying to do some things with sustainability and do, you know, bring cars that impact uh, the world for the better. And, and a lot of young leaders are, are, are really responding to that favorably. And then you look at the combined value of all the automakers to, to, to the one <laughs> Tesla. Right. But what's interesting to me is the courage. And when you said get involved, it's, um, you know, getting around other leaders. Uh, that's exciting. But he, uh, you know, I think he gave away all of his patents, which in business makes like you're, you know, you're trying to like, uh, I've got this and, you know, we're going to have a competitive advantage. But he needed the category of the electric vehicle to succeed if he wanted Tesla to succeed. Sure. And so, I mean, what I'm hearing from you in terms of like, you have your company and you're competing maybe with another company or, but these leaders are leaders growing for, you know, the best service of their investors and the people they serve. But if the category of owning apartments is under attack, mm -hmm. that's problematic. And right. so the power of getting involved and in, in doing things, I mean, that's what, I mean, that's what this studio is about. We're trying to do mm -hmm. what we can and you know, nationally or locally or whatever. And uh, so that, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful that you share that because um, um, sometimes people need to just get courageous and raise their hand and, um, you know, step up and, and, and lead the challenge. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, 
I think back 15 years ago, I was deathly afraid to get in front of a room of five people and talk. Right. Right. So it's about, you know, evolving and, and finding ways to, to better yourself, but also just to your point, uh, better the industry, right? Collaborate, ensure that we're successful uh, so we can we can do what we need to do uh, for our organization and our employees and our, and our residents. Right. Well, we are coming up on our final moments together. This has been awesome, amazing. I'd love to track your success. Keep keep talking to you. Uh, I know love we're to, local. Yeah. We're down the street. Yeah, exactly. Um, great to have you in the studio to share the time. Are there any final thoughts you want to leave our viewers with? No. I mean, I think I love what you're doing. I think uh, you know the the technology that we've discussed uh, along the way. I mean, it's allowing this to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm sure there's people commenting and sending questions and uh, I'll get a ton of feedback from my team and, and others after this. So I just love that we're, we're getting together and talking about these things, things that matter. Uh, and I think it'll propel our business and hopefully we'll all uh, be more successful as we go forward. And the industry as a whole will continue to, to grow and succeed. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you for being here, John. Once again, I uh, would love to follow up and uh, continue to track your success. Thank you, Patrick. All right. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Multifamily Innovation Show. Please remember to like and subscribe for more episodes. And don't forget to hit the notification bell so you can stay up to date on everything multifamily.